You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got John Sutton. John, how are we? I'm oh, very well, James. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks for coming on the show. You're a man who's spent time working in Britain's most toughest prisons. You've worked over 10 years. You've written over 10 books. A man who's very well experienced. You exposed a lot of stuff in the prison system as well. You've worked with some of the most dangerous prisoners from murderers, rapists, terrorists. You've worked with them all. But first and foremost, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks very much. I'm pleased to be here. I always like to go back to the start of my guest, John, get a bit of understanding about you, where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm the son of a police officer. And I honestly did believe as a young man that I would follow my father into the police. And when it came time for me to actually join the police, it was discovered that I was colourblind, that I couldn't see colours. And that was part of the medical for the police. So I couldn't join the police. So instead of joining the police, I joined uh, the the army, and uh, that's how, that's how I started out my career, really, in the army. What were you like at school, John? Oh, rubbish! <laughs> <laughs> oh, rubbish! And I really detested school. And one of my school teachers was a man called Colin Welland. Now, Colin Welland's quite famous, indeed. He won an Oscar as a, a as the screenwriter for a. a, a, a a movie called Chariots of Fire. He was also featured as a, as a, an actor in the in the film Kez, uh, and he was well known. And he was in Z Cars, and he was my school teacher. And he was a big six foot two inch curly headed fifteen stone bully who used to beat the kids up with a uh, a big uh, plimsoll. And uh, I always thought I'd get him. I wrote to his agent, you know, and said, "Is he still assaulting little children?" because I wanted to have a word with Colin Welland. And when I finally found out where he was, he'd become ill and I was just not going to go and see him if he was unwell. I wanted to see him when he was fit so I could slap his ass. What did you do after school? Uh, terrible, really. I mean, I wanted to be a journalist. I went to see the careers and they said, what do you want to be? I said, I want to be a journalist. I'm a writer because I was really good at writing. I'll tell you something at school. I used to write short stories. And uh, the, the class, I used to read them out to the class. And the, the class would be, oh, hey, you know, doing all that mad stuff, you know, about monsters that lived at the bottom of a pit. And when the wind blew from the west, you could hear them scream. All oh, the kids loved it, you know, and it was amused me. And I liked all this. The teachers used to rip my work up and throw it away. When it came time for reading, they could never find my work. Yeah. I detested that, I tell you. So when I left school, when I went to see the career, I said, oh, I want to be a journalist. Ha, 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 very funny. You're going to work down the pit or you'll work in a mine or you're going to be working in the mills. I eventually did end up working in the mills, working in the cotton mills, right at the end of the cotton, you know, the King Cotton where they were weaving. And have you ever, you never worked in a mill? Good God, it was noisy and loud. And you started at six o'clock in the morning, you know, and you'd work till two and then next week you'd be working two o'clock in the morning till ten o'clock at night and then when i became uh, old enough i was working nights that's nine o'clock at night till seven in the morning in the mills was it more money it was more money but i didn't get any my parents as i say were kind of strange they used to take my wage packet off me and give me a bit of spending money and that was it it was like modern day slavery they wouldn't allow it today what was the training like to be a prison officer back in the 60s, 70s? Uh, the, the original, you, you started off with doing the civil service entrance examination. And uh, when I turned up at Strangeways, it was run at Strangeways, the entrance exam for the Northwest. Uh, there were about 20 of us, and I think about eight of us passed the examination. So it wasn't a straightforward thing. And there were people there who really wanted to get in, but failed the exam. From the examination, you went for a, an, a, a medical and if you passed the medical, then you had an interview. And the interview consisted of a, a chief officer and two governors. 
and uh, they were asking you basic questions about your life and what you'd done and what you saw yourself in the prison service. And if you passed that, then you went on to a training school. There were two training schools. One was at HMP Wakefield, and the other one was at HMP Lay Hill, which was near Bristol. And I was uh, selected to go to HMP Lay Hill. So I went down to, to Lay Hill, and it was I think it was a 12-week course where you were taught about the basics of, uh, you know, how to disarm prisoners, you know, basic self-defense, which I knew anyway from the army, and uh, the basic rules and regulations of the prison service. So it was 12 weeks training, and then you were posted to a, a particular prison. I was sent from the training school to HMP Wormwood Scrubs. What was the pay like? How much were you getting per week, per month? Well, we've got to go back in time, you know, to 1975, early 1975. And I believe I was getting something in the region of about £40 per week, which was slightly more than I was getting as a, an NCO in the British Army when I left the British Army. So, as I say, in those days, it wasn't particularly bad pay. What was the first prison you worked in? Pardon? What was the first prison you worked in? HMP Wormwood Scrubs, which is located <clears throat> in the London West 12 on Duquesne Road. And Duquesne Road is the name of the uh, prison, uh, the, the master of the prison service who designed the prison in 1860, I believe it was. And that's when it dates from. Did you realise how hard it would have been from army prison to then going into one of London's toughest? Well, but the, the thing was, it wasn't particularly hard for me because I was used to dealing with people who didn't want to do things, you know, and that didn't bother me at all. But the problem was, of course, you've got people who are extremely violent, and uh, whilst the uh, the inmates in the prison and the army were violent, they wouldn't, as a rule, general rule, attack the staff because they knew what was coming. What sort of uh, what was the first bit of trouble you ever seen? Uh, well, I was, I was only there a very short while, and uh, the first bit of trouble was not with a particular inmate, it was with one of the governors. And uh, it was lunchtime, and uh, he opened up a Category A prisoner during lockdown at lunchtime, because the staff aren't on duty, they're out at lunch. And I said to him, excuse me, sir, this is a Category A inmate. I said, he's not allowed to be unlocked during lockdown. The staff aren't on duty. There's only me on this landing. There was over 200 inmates on one landing. That was C2 at Wormwood Scrubs. And uh, he said, do you know who I am? I said, uh, I know who you are, sir. I said, do you know the rules? He said, get about your duty. And he unlocked this Category A prisoner and took him off the landing down to his... Uh, his, his office on the ones and it subsequently transpired which i found out because i did some checking up on this that uh, the governor was smuggling out letters for this particular inmate and uh, so i went to see the inmate and i said uh, do tell me uh, what's the score here i mean i know that he's smuggling your letters out because he was getting letters in from the house of lords and it said things like, uh, absolutely charming to hear from you, wonderful letter. Do hope the staff at uh, our friends at the Scrubs are looking after you. Best wishes, Boothby, Lord Boothby, you know, from the House of Lords. And uh, I said to him, so I know that your letters, you've not been sending any letters to Boothby, because I've, se I've checked your, uh, your files. And if you sent a letter out, then it would be there. So tell me, why is this governor smuggling your mail out? And surprisingly enough, what, what transpired was he said that uh, the governor was uh, actively homosexual and that he was engaging in acts of uh, sexual relations with the governor and the governor in return was smuggling his letters out and bringing in small bottles of whiskey. <laughs> that This had to be reported, which I did. I wrote it all down and took the the letter sheets and all the rest, took it to the number one chief officer at, at the Scrubs who was in charge of all discipline grades. And uh, he went absolutely crazy. He said, who has authorised you to conduct an investigation into senior members of staff? Well, I had a warrant card. On the warrant card, it said, all prison officers, whilst acting as such, have all the powers of a police constable. I said, so that's my authority. You know, that's what I'm paid to do. I'm paid to protect this system. 
I said, and what you've got here is something that needs to be invested. Get out of my office. So you, you would think what would happen next. You'd think, all right, he's shouted at you, but you're going to do something about it. The next thing I knew was that there were police officers in the prison and inmates were coming up to me saying, what the bloody hell have you been at, Gov? I said, hmm just doing my job and I said there's uh, senior members of the CID downstairs asking questions about you they called the police in to investigate me not to investigate the governor deflection well they'd done something like that yeah so the governor was having an affair with one of the prisoners one of the category A prisoners <clears throat> yeah a homosexual affair well a lot I, it, it, it's well known that a lot of tough guy gangsters and East End villains and all the rest of it are gay for the stay. Well, I'm, get on with it. doesn't bother me. But when the governor is having a sexual relationship, or one of the governors, with, with a Category A inmate and jeopardising the security of the prison, it, it surely is beholden upon the staff to take action. Of course, when I did take action, the first thing I got was uh, the police investigating, not the governor, but me. What for? Well, I didn't have anything. They were on a fishing expedition. If they could have found anybody who would have given them uh, information about me that was to my detriment, then they would have no doubt charged me, but there wasn't anything. What happened to the governor? Well, <clears throat> that was very strange. I never saw him again after that. So they may have moved him to another establishment, but there was no word out, no nothing. Nobody said anything. The chief officer never said, oh, well done for doing that, or that was it. They just, he just disappeared out of the system. He's no doubt somewhere else because the system looks after its own. And how long were you in that prison? I was there for two years nearly, nearly two years. I had some terrible trouble at uh, Wormwood Scrubs. What else happened? Well, as I told you at the start, the, 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 the prison service provided accommodation for staff. And uh, I'd been there for about five months and I hadn't got any accommodation. And I went to see the Prison Officers Association, that's the union, supposedly the union that represents the prison staff. And I said, well, what's the score here? There's no accommodation for my wife. You know, she lives in Manchester, which she did. And uh, I've been posted up 200 miles up the road to this prison. And I said, and I'm looking for a house. They said, uh, oh, you you probably have to wait about 18 months. I said, oh, no. I said, I'm not waiting 18 months. I said, my wife's not been separated from me for 18 months. I said, so why can't we get a property? Oh, they said, they're, uh, they're, they're being, uh, we're looking after the property. You'll get yours in time, you know. So I thought, this is, they're just basically telling me to piss off, you know. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I'll investigate this. So I found out that there were about 20 junior officers recently joined the scrubs who were waiting for properties. So I called all these officers together in a meeting and I said, we've got to do something about this. I said, so we've got to find out how many houses are available. And one of the officers said, well, my father-in-law, his, his uncle or something like that, was the chief officer in the works department. He said, he'll know exactly how many properties are available so he came back about a week later and said there about 30 empty houses belonging to the scrubs so i went to see the peel i said hey i found out this is the only houses this is the chairman of the Prison officers association i said uh, he said oh yeah we're holding them back for senior members of staff that are coming in from other prisons i said and in the meantime you know i've got seen my wife uh, live my wife for six months I said and you're going to do that so I went back to all the junior staff. I said, what we've got to do is get a petition up here and go and see the governor. So I wrote this petition out. and I put my name on the top, John Sutton. And I, I was looking around and they, about, about 15 of them signed it. There were some that wouldn't because they didn't want trouble. And then I went to see the governor. And uh, well, I didn't ask to see the governor. I just went up and knocked on his door. And I said... Uh, this is what's happening. He said, uh, oh, he said, it's not down to me. It's down to the uh, housing committee. It's run by the Prison Officers Association. I said, no, it's not. I said, I've looked up the regulations. The head of this establishment is yourself, the prison governor, the one governor, Norman Honey, his name was. I said, and you're responsible for the housing. I said, you can allocate it to who you want. 
But at the end of the day, the responsibility rests with you. I said, and these staff here, led by me, require housing. And you've got housing that is available, but you're not allocating it. I said, now, if I don't get a quarter at the next allocation meeting, then myself and all these officers here will be outside your gate with banners. I said, and we'll be telling the press and the televisions, all the media, that you are restricting them and holding them back. I said, and that is in contrary to our contract of employment. And I gave him the uh, petition and walked out of his office. Uh, the next time there was a, a meeting of the housing committee, it was about six weeks away, I got a quarter, I got, I got accommodation. And all the other staff are coming to me saying, how have you done it, John, how have you done it? I said, well, it's quite simple. All you do is you get a petition, you put your name at the top, and you go and tell the governor, if you don't get a property, you're going to demonstrate outside his prison. But, I mean, you see, you couldn't, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't demonstrate. I knew they never would, but I would. Uh -huh. Were you going against them? Did you become a problem for? For the prison? Yeah. Uh, it did turn out like that. I never set out to do that. I didn't. I was just doing my job. There were there were problems there. Uh, I was searching cells. You know, you go to, as an officer, you go out to search people's cells to make sure that they've not got escape equipment and weapons or knives or anything like that. So I went to search a cell on D wing, which was the lifers wing. You know, the long term inmates wing. And uh, the particular cell I was searching, I didn't know who it was, really, because I was just had a list of cells, and I went round, and the guy wasn't in his cell. So I went to see the principal officer, and I said, in charge of the wing, and I said, I've got to search this cell. I want to know where this inmate is. Oh, he said, go and have a cup of tea, go and have a coffee or something like that, and then read the paper. He said, and then when you've done that, have a couple of hours, they bring it back, I'll sign your paper, say you've signed it, you searched it. I said, no, I said, I'm going to search the cell. I said, where is he? Well, he wouldn't tell me where he was for some unknown reason. So I eventually found the inmate. He was in a Spanish class. And I, and I went in there and said, you know, call his name out. I'd forgotten his name now. But anyway, uh, eventually he stood up and said, what do you want? I said, I'm going to search your cell. Come with me. Oh, no, I'm not going. Well, I was uh, pretty well old school, used to people doing what I told them, you know. So I thought, well, this guy says he doesn't want to do it. All right, so he'll do it with his arm up his back. <laughs> Grabs hold of him, arm up the back, shoot on the collar, like that, you know. And took him to his cell, struggling, kicking, screaming and shouting. But before I got to his cell, the staff, the prison staff on the landing on D-Wing come running up. What are you doing? What are you doing? I said, I'm going to search his cell. No, you're not. No, you're not. Get off him. I said, this man's not telling me I'm not going to search. I am going to search his cell. No, you're not. And then the principal officer turned up and said, you've got a minute to get off my wing. Get off. And the staff were going to, going to grab me. The prison staff. So I went from there to the chief, uh, the head of security for the scrubs and told him what had happened. I said, listen, they won't let me search this cell. There's something going on here. No, he said, there isn't. He said, I'll tell you what. I said, go and search some other cells. I said, are you being serious? I said, I'm going to put this in writing. So I put it in writing and I gave it to him. I said, that is exactly what happened. He said, no, he said, I'm telling you, go and search the cells on air wing, the other end of the prison. And that was the end of that. Except within two weeks the inmate whose cell I was going to search was on the roof of, of Wormwood Scrubs Prison, parading up and down, dressed up in a mock military uniform with an Irish flag, waving it up and down because he was a member of the IRA and he was demonstrating that the IRA prisoners should have political rights. And that's a, a fact. That was, that was, I think that was February 1976. It's on on the uh, internet. Check it out. How bad was it <clears throat> in the seventies? Obviously, now it's more luxury. You've got TVs. Some prisons have got showers in their cell. How hard was it then? Slopping out and just well, I mean, absolutely filthy. I mean, I worked on the the, the biggest, the <clears throat> biggest single prison landing in Europe, which was C two landing at Wormwood Scrubs. There were over two hundred inmates, three to a cell, and uh, there was. Uh, four 
your, your urinals recesses, you know, but there was no internal sanitation. And I said, well, when I, when I first joined, I said to one of the senior staff, I said, they're going to be ringing the bell, you know, asking to get to the toilet. I said, should I let them out? He said, you should let them out here, mate. He said, straight, there's one answer, that's get on your fucking pot. You know, I said, that's what you say. If they rang the bell, get on your pot. And that was it. That was the sanitation. It was filthy, dirty, disgusting. Uh, there were some interesting characters on there on C2 Landing. There was one inmate there called uh, Peter Cook. Do you know who Peter Cook is, the Cambridge rapist? Oh. Just a bit before your time, but he used to wear a leather mask <coughs> with a zip at the front and rapist r written on the top. Yeah. Gimp mask. Pardon? A gimp mask. Yeah. And he, he raped, I don't know, maybe 30 or so uh, female students in Cambridge. And uh, he was on C2 landing, sentenced to uh, multiple life sentences, except he was extremely weird. And uh, one day I opened his cell, and instead of being dressed as an inmate, he was a Category A, by the way, so we had a single cell. Uh, I opened his cell. He was he had a dress on. He'd, he'd got a bed sheet, painted it with paint from the art class, and made himself a dress. And he got this dress on, nothing else, completely naked underneath all that it was wearing underneath was an extremely large penis that was erect he jumped out of his cell mr sutton mr sutton i love you kiss me and he was trying to well i knew what to do i spun him round and ran him head first into the side of his cell and threw him inside i thought bollocks to that i'm not being raped by the cambridge rapist i don't fancy that how did other people treat him was he not a target Especially if you're in with IRA murderers. He was an extremely powerful man. Strong. Oh, yeah. Extremely powerful. But not very tall, about five foot six, five foot five. And, uh, but extremely powerfully built. So he would take some doing. And he was a category A. So he never went anywhere, anywhere unsupervised. So he, they wouldn't be able to get at him. And eventually, I believe he was sectioned. Not case. Yeah, yeah, I think he was sent to Broadmoor in the end. Was there many like gay affairs with inmates in prison? Well, I mean, as I said before, people especially for the long termers. Oh, long termers, you know, they get gay for the stay. You know, you'd have. Uh, it's still fucking weird that, isn't it? You're either gay or you're not. So, mm. if, if people are doing twenty, thirty years, listen, it's each to their own. But it's still mm. strange. Uh, it may seem strange. I mean, uh, if people want to do that, I mean, I'm not a. Yeah, I'm so not going to get involved, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, but, uh, and if I came across inmates who were engaging in that, well, I'd just bang on the door and say, you know, come on, cut it out, don't get caught doing that, you know, you're going to get yourself, because I wouldn't intervene with them, because I had a degree of sympathy with the poor bastards being locked up in disgusting, disgraceful situations like that. How was that scene, man, who's so-called gangsters and murderers then, all fucking shagging each other in their cells? Well, it wasn't so much shagging them. I mean, there was a lot of uh, fellatio, you know, sucking dicks, yeah? Uh, I had only been on the landing about a couple of months and some a brand-new prisoner who had only been there a couple of days came to me and said, uh, how much is it, uh, boss, for... Uh, to, sucking dicks i said don't, don't ask me you know I said ask one of the cleaners they'll probably be able to help you so i said to the cleaners did he come and ask you oh yeah i said uh we told him it was like quarter of an ounce of tobacco you know that's how much because the, 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 the currency on the landings at that time wasn't drugs it was tobacco and he said, but he said, the strange thing is, he said, he doesn't want somebody to suck his, he wants to pay people to suck theirs. Yeah. It's fucking creepy though, isn't it? <laughs> like you say, it's each to their own, but <clears throat> he was, was he like, there was a like, prostitutes inside Cat A as well? Yeah. Yeah. They, 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 they service you for a quarter of an ounce. Oh, was that because drugs weren't rife back then, were they, 70s? They drugs were, weren't, not in the 70s, no. Because people would do anything for their hit. But then it is, mm. what are they doing, just sucking dick for tobacco? Just tobacco, yeah. Yeah. There's easier ways to get tobacco in my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> you should have sent, yeah, who was the guy who was having an affair yeah. with a prisoner? 
Yeah. Who was the guy who was having the affair with the prisoner? At the start of the podcast, he says... Oh, yeah, that well, that was the governor. The governor, you should have sent the fucking governor to him. <laughs> Maybe that's why he became the governor, mate. It was a fucking easy gig for him. Well, I mean, some people get themselves into positions like that because that's their intention. I mean, where are you going to find people who are wanting to be involved in that kind of thing? The ideal place would be prisons or schools or nurseries or something like that depends what you what you as you say you've all got your your little niche in life who I mean, else the, was in that prison well there was a the, the train robbers were in there but the real train robbers not ronnie biggs ronnie biggs was a driver uh the real train robbers were gordon goody and all that one how long did they get well they, they got like 30 years but they didn't serve 30 years they served about 15 where did ronnie go was it brazil Ronnie escaped from Wandsworth and he went to Brazil, yeah. And, uh, but he was not considered to be anything by the actual train robbers. They thought he was just a gopher, you know, drive me here, drive me there. So he wasn't any, any big name, you know, he wasn't Buster or anybody like that. Were you there when he escaped? No, I wasn't at uh, Wandsworth, no. How dangerous was it for a prison officer in the 70s around mad men? Was your life ever in danger, or were you the peacemaker? Yeah, you, you, were, you were at all times aware, you know, that, that there were inmates who were extremely dangerous, and uh, the, the big one was the IRA, of course. Uh, and for some unknown reason, once I got on the wrong side of the uh, the Prison Officers Association, which didn't take me very long, uh, I found myself being put in charge of Category A visits for the IRA. Now, that at that time, because they were highly politically motivated, they had to have the secluded visits. So if, say, you were the, the IRA and I was your, your brother or something like that, I, as a prison officer, would be sat next to you making notes. I mean, you can imagine how oppressive that is. I ain't got any choice because that was my job. And at the end of it, I had to report back to the security department to tell them what had gone on. And the, and the IRA is saying to me things like, we know where you live, you know. We know who you are, exactly. So the problem was that you, you your, your life's in danger. The IRA doesn't fuck about, man. It's not like <laughs> your gangsters who maybe make the threats and the shouts. Oh, they no, probably that. didn't know where you lived. They would have had every detail on every prison officer. That, they only absolutely did. I never got uh, attacked by prisoners I mean I always try to be understanding and reasonably fair I have a degree of empathy I mean I'm partly Irish you know I, I understand the, the 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 reason that they're doing it I just don't follow along that you should blow people up you know I draw a line somewhere yeah it's mad I've had IRA men on I've had UDA men on I've had British soldiers on it's just crazy just a few years ago that people were actually all killing each other in Ireland it's mad to think the the, the war that went on there and the people and the lives that were ruined, it's, it's mad. Like you say, you can, if you look at it from both sides, there's always people fighting for their cause and their beliefs, but <clears throat> when you break it all down, it is crazy to think it was only a few years ago that yeah. that was happening. It's not that long ago. I had two friends killed in in, in uh, Northern Ireland. Two brothers who were boxers in the same army boxing team as me, they were killed on duty. Two brothers. I had another friend who was blown up Three of his his colleagues were killed. He was severely injured. And he's never been the same since. When did you leave Wormwood Scrubs? Uh, I left Wormwood Scrubs in 1977. What for? Well, um, as I said, it, it took me a while to get a quarter. Now, once I'd got up somewhere to live, yeah, I thought, well, it's all right. I've got a job. I've got a wife. And my wife became pregnant and uh, so we were looking forward to the future and uh, I came home one day and uh, I said to my wife what's all this noise outside she said oh it happens every other night that and what it was was a gang of louts about four or five of them standing because we were on the second floor up and they were standing in the park car park below the, the flats you know they were like what they call them, masonettes, you know. And uh, they were shouting abuse up at the occupants. Ah, we know you work. We know your husband's away. We'll come up and give you a good scene too, missus. You know, what you really need is some of this. I said, I'm not having this. So I went down to see them. 
I said, uh, excuse me. I said, uh, what are you doing here? You don't live here, do you? Go on, pissed off, you know, bastard, all that. I was about 26 at the time. They were about 16, 17, you know. So I said, I'll tell you what. I said, if you come around here again, I said, I will, I will go, I'll go and see your parents. Go and see my parents. They'll tell you to piss off. I can do what I want. So I knew who the big, the big one was. He was about six foot three, actually, and he was the son of the chairman of the Prison Officers Association. So the next night after work, I went round to his house and said, uh, I just want to have a word with you. He let me in. He said, I want to have a word with you about your son. He's coming round to the the quarters where all the staff live and shouting abuse and threatening me and saying, oh, I can go and see my father. He said, uh, he said, Mr. Something, he said, uh, I know I'm going to have trouble with you. He said, if you ever lay hands on my son or approach him again, he said, I will have you arrested. I said, are you being serious? I said, he's annoying all the, all the res residents of the quarters, shouting obscene and obscenities at them. He said, no, get out of my house. I thought, that's strange. I said to him, there is going to be trouble. And sure enough, about two weeks later, his son was, we had a staircase to go up to where I lived, and his son was sprawled across it with two of his mates. I said to him, come on, get out of the way. I want to get through to my house. Go on, climb over us, you old bastard. All I said, the other. So I did attempt to climb over him, and as I did so, he kicked me in the eye which split all my eye. And uh, when I tried to chase him, get him, he ran off. So I thought, well, I'm going to report this to the police. So I reported it to the police. They didn't do anything, didn't question him, didn't do anything. And it came round about three months later that it was the cup final, United versus somebody or other, and United lost. And I don't follow football, so I'm not, uh, wasn't bothered anyway. And I've been working at the scrubs, and I came back. And I said to my friend who was with me, uh, I said, let's go and have a beer. You know, my wife was about seven months pregnant at the time. And I said, let's go and have a beer in the pub, pub called the Askew Arms, which is about a quarter of a mile away. So as we left my house and went down these gang of louts followed us there were four of them and when we got into the pub my friend said to me just ignore them john just ignore them i said well i'll ignore them you know i'm as long as they don't bother me anyway we got into the pub and i was just about to order a beer when into the pub came these louts picked up glasses and they said uh, right something we're going to kill you now came across the pub, and I, there was no way out of the... There was no way back. The, behind me was the, the, the toilets and the, a stone wall. There was no exit. I couldn't go backwards. I couldn't go forwards because there were three of them. So as they, as they approached me with the glasses in their hands, saying they were going to kill me, I terminated the three of them very quickly and uh, put them down on the floor... And they called the ambulance and took the big one away. When she got a fractured skull, I didn't know at the time. I mean, I didn't mean to hit him that hard. I didn't. I just wanted to prevent myself from being killed, being injured. And I was subsequently charged with uh, actual bodily harm and taken to Knightsbridge Crown Court. You can imagine how stressful that is for your wife when she's seven months pregnant. I was found not guilty. I mean, I said, you know, I mean, this is ridiculous. Three big lads come into a pub threatening to kill me in front of witnesses. And I defend myself and you charge me. You know, what? what's all this about? Anyway, I was found not guilty and uh, offered a transfer and I went. What would have happened if you got remanded, a prison officer in? Oh, I'd have, in got, I'd have got... I'd have got imprisonment. In fact, when I was... Oh, up, but you would have become a target for the inmates because oh, you were a prison officer. Oh, yeah, it would have been untenable. It would have been unbearable. But when I was at Knightsbridge Crown Court, the dock officer, because it lasted two days, the trial, on the second day, the dock officer said, he said, do you see those two guys sat down there? I said, yeah. I said, why? Because I thought you were just members of the public, you know. It's an open court. He said, no, I said, they're the officers that are going to take you to prison when it's finished. I said, I said who says I'm going to get found guilty? He said, well, I've assessed it. He said, and I reported this, and I think you're going to prison today. I didn't. 
What would you have got? A few years? Probably would have got a couple of years. And where did you go after that? I was uh, posted to uh, Strange Ways. What was it like in there the first day? Because Strange Ways was a tough prisoner. Oh, yeah, it's same kind of thing as Wormwood Scrubs. I mean, the thing about the places like the Scrubs, ones with Pentonville, Strange Ways, they're called Screws Necks, or they were. You know, they're run by the jailers, not by the inmates. The inmates, to a certain extent, in some prisons, operate a degree of control is not down to the staff running it, the inmates run it. But at places like Strange Ways, the staff run it, and it's what's known as a screw's neck. Because you hear a a lot of stories about the screws being ruthless back then. They were. Killing inmates, beating inmates, stealing from inmates. Did you see a lot of that? Not stealing from inmates, but beating inmates, yeah. For no reason? For no reason. No reason other than entertainment. I was on duty one night. Uh, this guy called him Big John, yeah. He was a big Irishman, about six foot two, about 16 stone. Great big Irishman, you know, strong as strong as anything. And uh, we were on the uh, YP wing, about 100 young, young offenders, you know, and somebody did something which was ridiculous. And he said, right, I'm going to sort this. And he went from cell to cell, from every cell and in every cell, he gave all the inmates a beating. A hundred inmates, one after the other. Just grabbed them, punched them, threw them away. Next one, smack. I phoned up the duty prince. I said, I think there's something wrong with the man I'm working with because I never met him before. He said, what's up? I said, it's, it's John such a body, you know. And I said, he's going around battering all the inmates. He said, how long have you been here? I said, oh, about a month. Yeah, he said, you'll get used to it. <laughs> get used to it. Get used to that. He ended up as a good friend of mine, John. He was all right, never did that again. But he was not a, a, what's that, what I'd call a maniac. Do you think a lot of people use that job to be violent towards others? Yeah, I, I'm sure that there are people who, do, who did at the time specifically join the prison service because they were verging on psychopaths. Strangely enough, Many years later, I was working as a hospital officer with the recruitment board. I was doing the medicals. And uh, I said to one of the governors, I said, I said, there's some very strange people working in the prison service, you know. I said, you're at the head of the recruitment board. I said, what are you really looking for when you interview the people? He said, well, to tell you the truth, he said, we're looking for the biggest psychopaths in Britain. <laughs> That's what that's what the governor who was in charge of the of the recruitment board said. They were looking for nutters. What was it like moving from London to Manchester? Especially with your message just about to give birth, was that? Oh no, my missus she had done that by then, yeah. She had she had given birth by then at Hammersmith Hospital. So uh, moving to Strange Ways, well, <clears throat> I mean, they'd marked my card, hadn't they? So as soon as I got there, you know, the, the chief officers warned me, this isn't the scrubs, you know, something. Once you're back here, you know, we're going to make sure you don't piss around in this place. So it was a little bit, uh, they were a little bit aggressive. Towards who, you? Yeah, towards me. And I, I was, at the time, uh, I'd done two years, so I wasn't wet behind the ears, you know, I knew what I was doing. Mm-hmm. But uh, they, they were quite aggressive, and a lot of the staff uh, thought that I'd, I'd be in some way uh, really transgressed and I was bad news, you know. What sort of prisoners were in strange ways at that time? Uh, it was the same kind of uh, setup, excuse me, banging the microphone, same kind That's of right. setup as, uh, as Wormwood Scrubs, same kind of setup, category A prisoners. One of the inmates there was. Uh, Donald Nielsen, I believe his name was, the Black Panther. Who's that? Uh, he's the guy who tied that, that girl up and hung her from uh, a drain, had a wire around her neck, and he was in there. He'd been shooting people, armed robberies, and eventually tried to extort money by kidnapping this young lady and uh, dangled her from a, a wire. On, uh, in a sewer drains and uh, she died and he was in there serving life he was a maniac the first time I met him he was running on the spot in his cell he'd been an ex, ex-soldier 
and he liked to think he was some kind of special forces hero or something. All day, you'd open his cell in the morning, press-ups, sit-ups, running on the spot, running round the cell, jumping up and down. All day, never stopped. It was really weird. He was really weird. He was. And there was a guy called George Wilkinson, who was one of the biggest men I've ever seen. He was something like the the size of Tyson Fury, you know, about six foot seven. He wasn't quite six foot nine, but he was big, and he'd been throwing his weight around in Cumbria and terrorising this village. I think he was in Cockermouth or somewhere like that, and. Uh, he was in. He was in the block. He'd come into prison, and he thought he could do what he did in the in the village. You know, throw his weight around and bully the staff. So they snatched him and stuck him in the in the cells in, in the block at Strange Ways because they had the block. Have you heard of the block? Yeah. Yeah. Well, he was in the block at Strange Ways. Solitary confinement. Yeah. yeah solitary yeah. confinement. Yeah. So he was in the block at Strange Ways, and and when he got down there, he met they had. The staff all had nicknames because one of them was the school bully. They had uh, the black dog and the Chinese money box because he used to twist your arms so you looked like a Chinese money box. <laughs> By the time he finished, yeah, a piggy. I think he was just because he was a, a pig. You know? <laughs> but uh, so he came across that lot and lost. He came second. The block came first. The block won. Uh, so when I saw him, he was standing in a bowl of water. All six foot seven of him and about eighteen stone, stark naked, drinking water. I said to him, You wanna don't wanna be doing this, you know. I said, You're gonna you're gonna be ill. So I asked the staff, I said, oh, has he seen the doctor? Oh yeah, they said he's going to Walton jail tomorrow, he's bloody mad. Anyway, the next day he was transferred to Walton and that's where they found him, dead in his cell. What happened to him? I think he'd done his kidneys in with drinking water all the time. He'd made himself ill, but he couldn't stand it, you see. It had psychologically destroyed him. He'd been used to being the big boy. And when he got to Strange Ways and he hit a brick wall, that was the end of him. You know, he couldn't psychologically deal with it. He just didn't want to be around anymore. Where did you work in Strange Ways? What about you working in the block? I did work in the block. I wasn't regular staff in the block, but I worked in the block. I was uh, down there on a on a reasonably regular basis, and there were a number of inmates in there. Uh, one of them was a very strange character called Terry Sinclair, who was a, a major drug dealer from New Zealand, and he was appealing his sentence. He was involved in the the handless corpse killings, where they cut the hands off the body and threw it into uh, a, a, a diving pool called Eccleston Delft near Chorley. Not too far from here, actually. And uh, down he went, the, the corpse, and divers who were practising scuba diving found the body floating at the bottom. Its head all caved in, so you couldn't take it, all the teeth ripped out, and its hands cut off. And the guy behind that was called Terry Sinclair, and uh, he was a multi, multi-millionaire drug dealer from New Zealand. He'd got a yacht property all over the world. And he openly let it know that he was offering a million pounds for anybody who could get him out of strange ways. But he was down the block, you know. I mean, it's difficult to get out of there when you've got keys. <laughs> Did anybody ever escape when you worked there? Yes, from the scrubs they did actually, and uh, I knew the guy as well. His name was Eric Allison. He ended up as the uh, crime correspondent for the Guardian National newspaper. But uh, at the time, he was a, a forger and a fraudster and a bank robber. Extremely intelligent man, Eric Allison. And what he did was he, he forged a bench warrant a bench warrant from the court, from the high court, to release him from prison and got a fake firm of solicitors in Manchester to serve it on the governor. And the governor released him from prison on the strength of this forged bench warrant. And uh, so Eric Allison, that's how he escaped. You know, he didn't climb over the wall. But uh, that, that's how he did it. But Eric Allison did get out of prison. How is it when people are dead in their cell? Did you see much of that, suicides? Or? 
Suicides, people yeah, people hanging themselves. I mean, it's not a great deal of fun cutting people down from the road. I mean, you got to say if the, if the, if it's come to that, with the system has failed, because you should always give people some degree of hope. And you know, as I said at the beginning, you know, when I was dealing with prisoners in the military, you, you they've got to look at this as a blip in in time. You know, put it to one side, and you'll get out in the end. But people who do that, they're not getting out, are they? They're there forever more. Do you know, I, I still have, I, I would say it's post-traumatic stress disorder. I have a recurring dream. And I can't get out of this dream. I'm walking around the landings at strange ways, and I can't find the way out. Night, it doesn't always happen, but sometimes it, it occurs three or four nights in a row. And uh, I think that's post-traumatic stress. That, that was from patrol in the landings but yeah finding inmates hanging in the cells but when i was there at the time there was a big thing about cell fires you know the the rumor went round some kind of crazy jail rumor that if you were involved in a cell fire what would happen was you get six months off you and you survive you get six months off your sentence which was utter nonsense so people were setting cell fires to attempt to survive them and then get time off them, which you never would. But one, one particular cell, I think it was E3 landing at Strange Rays, uh, two of the inmates decided they were going to do this. They were going to set fire to the cell. And uh, the third inmate didn't want to do it, so they tied him to his chair, strapped him down to stop him from preventing them from doing this. And they set fire to the cell, and that's where they found him. All three of them burnt to death in the cell. One of them's tied to the chair. How does the cell go up? If it's all bricks, only the mattress they can buy. Oh, no, that was the mat. That was the problem. You see, it was the mattress. The mattresses at the time were made out of foam, and the foam, when it was lit, gave off a poisonous gas, and it was the poisonous gas that killed them. And then the rest of the stuff, they had, they, they had wooden furniture in there, and they had bed clothes, and they had their own clothing. And it would all take off like that. Do you think that's why they were made from a poison? So for the people do it, they would die? No, I don't think they'd deliberately done that. I just think they'd done you it look as, at, as cheaply as possible. I yeah. you look at Grenfell, mm. the flats went up and it was poison. It was easy to let. Do you think that could have been a possibility as well? When, oh. when they left those mattresses so that people would die? I don't believe that anybody would be as diabolical as that. I don't believe it. I think they'd done it cheaply. So the cheapest possible mattresses they could get. I mean, these weren't, they had no support. They were just made out of sponge rubber. So I think they'd just done it cheaply and they didn't realise, I don't believe that if you set fire to them, that it would, it, they would emit noxious fumes. But then again, after one or two, you think, okay. It's... Oh, they did get rid of them in the end. Did they? Yeah. E eventually they did get rid of them. They got rid of all the lot. Because I mean, mental health, everybody talks about mental health now and suicide and it's rife, but... Back then, in the 70s, I'd imagine no, not many people spoke about it. Was suicide bad still back in the 70s, or was it just now and again? It was considered to be uh, what happened in prison. You know, you, there was no um, support for people, you know, no psychological support. I mean, for a period of time, uh, I, they had a, an education department, but there was the, the staff viewed them as the enemy. I mean, don't forget, we're going a certain mindset here. In the seventies, prison staff viewed inmates as being they, they they were the enemy. You know, they were there to be punished, and a lot of the staff got it into their head that they were the people that were going to administer this punishment, and that they were going to make sure that they suffered whilst they were in there. So, if inmates were screaming and sh they didn't mind. Because that, that was what they was intended. How many prisoners were in Strange Ways at that time? At one point, believe this or not, it was over 2,000 inmates. There were so many prisoners in Strange Ways at one point that uh, they hadn't got any cells for them. They put them down in the gymnasium and put mattresses on the floor and they slept on the mattresses. How many prison officers? Over 2,000. So 2,000 of each? No, oh, 2,000 inmates. About how many prison officers? How many? About 400 prison officers. 
But we're going back to a time when uh, if you told uh, 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 inmates to do things, they, they generally did it. Was that through fear? Y yes, at strange ways. It, that's how it was run. And don't forget, we had a madman as a governor. I consider him to be insane, Norman Brown. How? Well, uh, this is the number one governor, the highest ranking grade in the whole prison, in charge of 2,000 inmates, 400 staff, yeah? One afternoon, I saw him. He went out of his office. He'd seen somebody throw what's known as a shit parcel, yeah? That's, in other words, because they couldn't get out of the cell to use the toilets, they got some newspaper, put it on the floor of the cell, defecated into the newspaper, wrapped the newspaper up, and thrown it through the cell window, yeah? Norman Brown, in his office, which was on F-wing, overlooking the side of E-wing, he'd seen this happen. So he went out of his office. This is about 2.30 in the afternoon, and he'd been drinking in the club from about 12 o'clock, because he used to get pissed every dinner time. He used to drink in the club. That was a, the prison officer's club where they served alcohol at dinner time. That was a regular recurrence. Uh, he'd come out of the club, back to his office, seen this ship parcel fly out the window, came out, went round, picked it up with his hands, picked it up with his hands, walked into the prison, ordered the staff, I was on the landing, to open the landing, open the, open the cell door, and he threw it at the inmates inside. A great flying ship pass. <laughs> it, it, hit, it hit this inmate on the side of his shoulder here, splattered shit all over the place. There was excrement all over Norman Brown's hands, and he shouted at them, I'll teach you, you dirty bastards. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is the number one governor of Strange Ways. That was the tone of the place. I bet you a mess then. It was a mess, especially as he got the wrong cell. <laughs> 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 to be fair man if a fucking governor was doing that I'd probably respect him more because I think he's just fucking one of us he was well he was one of them <laughs> yeah that's what I'm saying he's just a fucking nutcase he was was people scared of him or did they find that not fuck with him mentality because he'll do what we're doing kind of thing was he, he trying to match oh he was encouraging it he was encouraging it it was Norman Brown that appointed uh, the school bully as being one of the the, the, the block officers. Because they picked the block officers specially, you know, for being people who were, I would say, virgin on being psychopaths. <laughs> but do you feel as if that kept a tone in the prison for people not to fuck around because they knew the people in charge were psychopaths? Oh, yeah, they knew all right. And they didn't, they did fear the idea that they were going to get snatched down there because they knew what was waiting. There's an old joke, the school bully, if you were, say, you'd kicked up on the landing and you got half a dozen staff, drag you down the block, throw you in the block, you get put into a cell and the next thing, the door opens and there's the, the school bully and says to you, you've got 10 seconds to hit me. I'll just go and take your best swing, hit me. See, because when you've done that, I'm going to give you the best hiding you've ever had in your life. And that's what he did every time. Didn't matter who they were. You've seen it on TV. Loads of these people say things like, I was too tough for strange ways and they couldn't handle me. Well, I did 11 years and I never saw anybody win. Nobody. So a lot of people get beaten to shit. <laughs> What happened if an inmate did batter a screw? Would it then be six prison officers, ten prison officers come in and... Oh, absolutely, yeah. There was a time at, towards the end of my career when I was a hospital officer where they introduced a thing called Largactyl, which is a psychotropic drug, which, which is given to people who are suffering from psychotic incidences, and that and they was forcibly injected into inmates, you know, so if they kicked up and they looked like they were getting somewhere, it happened to, uh, what's his name, Paul Sykes, you know, the boxer, he kicked off in strange ways, and uh, there were four staff held him down, and I was called to give him an injection in his backside with that, and he was quiet after that, you know. 
In fact, all the rest of his sentence, he was on Largactyl, liquid Largactyl. Ten mils and a cough. Do you know what that is? No. Well, they'd get prescribed by the doctors to get 10 mils of Largactyl at 50 milligram or whatever it was, you know. So you you got these little tots that have got marks on 10 mils, 20 mils, you know. So you pour in them out, you got 10 mils <coughs> and a cough. So instead of getting 10 mils, they got just a little bit more. Make sure they were nice and quiet, you know. Was that just numb the brain? They walk around like bloody zombies. And they do that to the the more top end prisoners, the yeah, ones who could the, cause the, riots. The ones that the, that could do it, the ones that would cause the riots, yeah. But that's ruthless, isn't it? Fucking it's like a, a mental institute then. That's what it was. That was strange ways. That's why they took the roof off. So people were just getting injected and just shutting them down, basically? You, you, as an hospital officer, it's not my prerogative to actually say, right, I think this guy needs uh, medication. I have to speak to a doctor. But, I mean, the way it worked was the doctor started to trust the staff. So if I knew a doctor, I'd ring him up and say, this guy needs a... Whatever you think's right, Mr. Sutton, I'll sign it. That's how it worked. And and there weren't just me. There were loads of the hospital officers who did that. Who was Paul Sykes as, as an inmate? Uh, he was originally uh, a big bully. And he, he used to help himself to the younger inmates, the younger men. He used to... Uh, because he was gay for the stay when he was in there. You know, we, we previously discussed this. And Paul Sykes would help himself to the younger inmates and... Uh, what they were telling me was he used to get a copy of page three from the sun when they used to have those topless women on, yeah, and uh, put that onto the back of his victim on their back and then bend them over the bed and bugger them. So he was kind of having the best of both worlds in a way. <laughs> Strange character. But he was obviously a big, hefty guy who was trouble. But he wasn't trouble once he got the large actor in him. He just didn't know where he was. He was shuffling along like a tramp. Was there many people on that? The, indeed, there were, I would say, you know, probably about 5% of the population, of the prison population. Some heavy stuff, that, no? Well, I, I don't believe that they do it now because uh, they no longer have... That's human rights, isn't it? Yeah, they no longer have hospital officers. You see, what happened was, if you were a discipline officer, as I was working on the discipline side, you know, locking people up, day-to-day -day tasks, you could apply to the government, the home office, to go on a, a training course to become a hospital officer. That's like a nursing officer. And uh, you went away to a training school and you trained for three months... And if you pass the exams, and it was partly run by the NHS, it wasn't a complete kangaroo setup, you know, it was professional. And if you got a certificate from the Home Office, a nursing certificate, you were then a fully blown registered nurse. <clears throat> and that's how I became a hospital officer. See, when you're in strange ways, John, what was the worst thing you'd seen? One absolutely <clears throat> disgusting, diabolical thing that I did see was I was taking the psychiatrist round to the inmates on the block. And we came to one, one inmate and uh, the psychiatrist said, I'm, I'm cautious about this man, he's very dangerous. I'm, I want you to stand as close to me as you can, you know, without being too obtrusive. So I did and I stood next to him and the guy's ranting away and he's starting shouting, the mice have been in here, blue mice, pink mice, polka dot mice. Yellow mice, they're running around my cell. I see them all the time. And uh, he, the psychiatrist just listened to him for a bit and said, thank you very much. You're going to shut the door, you know. So he said, no, he's obviously having a, a really serious psychotic incident. You know, we're going to... He said, yeah, don't worry. He said, uh, he'll be in, ba in Broadmoor this time next week. He said, that's my recommendation. So I thought no more about it. You know, the guy's obviously completely lost these marbles and I was sat with the block staff 
about five o'clock just before it was time to go home and we're having like a coffee. And I said, oh, that poor bastard's going to Broadmoor next month, next week. He said, uh, why is he going? They're laughing away, you know. I said, oh, I see mice that are yellow, pink and polka dot. And yeah. They said, really? They were pissing themselves. I said, what's so funny about that? He said, we've been painting them. <laughs> They'd been painting the mice using paint from the art school and putting them in his cell. So he wasn't just seeing yellow, pink, and polka dot mice. They did exist. They were created by the staff. I mean, imagine deliberately driving somebody around the bend like that. Now that was that. But who are you going to complain to? I went down the block one day, and I was a hospital officer at the time, and I had a tray with the medication on. And as I entered the block, because it's locked away from all the rest of the prison, it's 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 below there's a roof on it you know a solid roof and it's like in a dungeon you know so i went in there and as i walked in i could see the staff running along the landing booting this inmate who was on the floor stark naked being kicked around they were taking turns at kicking him and they kicked him so hard that the boot polish from the boots had embedded itself into his body. You could see all the black marks all over him. He kicked some of his teeth out. His eyes were, were bashed in. There was blood pouring from his head. I put the tray down and ran up and got hold of the man by the top of his head and dragged him to an empty cell and locked him in the cell. And I said to the staff, you leave him alone. I'm going to get the medical officer. So I thought, I thought the staff, I thought they were going to come and get me, <laughs> you know, because they were they had that like a bloodlust, you know. So then I went out of there and I got the senior medical officer and brought him back. I said, "You better look at this man. I think he's seriously injured." <clears throat> he was injured. There was blood all over him, boot polish in his body, bruises all over. Uh, so I opened the cell and took the senior medical officer in, and I said please have a look at him so i looked at him and uh the head of the the block was standing behind me and the senior medical officer said to me i can't see anything wrong with this man mr sutton he said why have you brought me here he said you're wasting my time aren't you he turned around and walked out that was it they were all complicit in the abuse system every single one of them how bad was the abuse for the prisoners, towards the prisoners from the prison officers? Sometimes it was diabolical. I was on duty <clears> one night and uh, they, were, they, had a, they, they decided in their wisdom to, to create a, a bar like a barrack room where they'd knock three cells into one. And they had about 16 inmates in barrack, you know, like bunk beds. And they were, and for some reason they were banging and clattering and making a noise. So I was on duty with this uh, rather large jailer, about six foot five. He was a real character, this one, but a drunk, you know, and he'd been drinking all dinner time and he was still stunk of alcohol. And I said to him, oh, I'll go and have a word with him. He said, no, he said, it's my turn now. He said, I'm going to sort them out. And he, he drew his truncheon and he went up and opened this thing, and there were about 16 of these inmates, and he went in with his trunch, and I could hear all the screaming and the banging and the clattering and the shouting. and the. So I, I went up, and when I opened the door and had a look in, there he was battering every single one of them with his trunch. There were bodies on the floor bleeding and people hiding under the beds. <laughs> <laughs> He'd done every single one of them. There was no complaints next morning. No complaints. Was there any celebrities? Yeah, there was the celebrities. I mean, I, I can't really name him, you know, because it's not fair. He's done his thing and he's made a wonderful career for himself. But he always used to say to me, oh, he said, I used to deal in antiques. Boss, he said, I'll tell you how to do it. He said, all you do is buy him cheapest chips and that's it. You know, so anyway, uh, he was. The, I made him the landing cleaner because he was an affable kind of guy. But the original landing cleaner had tried to bribe me. He said, uh, oh, he said, uh, I need to get my mate as the, my assistant. You know, he said, I want you to make, put him in as my assistant, make him a red band. I said, well, why would I do that? I said, he's got to be vetted to do that. I said, no, I don't know who this guy is. He said, listen, he said, you do that for me. He said, I'll make it worth your while. I said, really? I said, and what, what's on offer? He said, well, he said, I'm the head bouncer for a big club in Blackpool. 
He said, uh, all you've got to do is get me my cellmate that I want. He said, and you can go to this club, mention my name. He said, and anything you want, women, you know, booze, food, anything. You put you up for the night. And I said, I, I said it's very tempting. I said, but don't you think it's a bit dangerous? I said, what happens if somebody finds out? Nobody's going to find out. He said, I said, come on. I said, did somebody find out? No, I said, I saw you who's done it. And he gave me a list of the officers that had done it, <laughs> that he bribed. Seriously. So I said, oh, I'll see you after dinner then. I'll, I'll have a think about this. So I went to see these officers one at a time. One was a principal officer. There was a couple of senior officers. I said, you'll not believe this. I said, but I've just been offered a bribe by this inmate. Great big fella. And uh, he told me that he'd been offering bribes to staff and that you'd been taking them. I said, but I don't personally believe him, but that's not for me to decide. I'm going to put a paper into the governor reporting this. I said, and you've got about half an hour to decide what you're going to tell him. Well, the principal officer starts jumping up and down and running around in a circle. <laughs> you can't do that. You can't do that. I said, I'm about to do it, which I did. Anyway, when I came back after dinner, I went up to see this uh, inmate, and he weren't there. I said, well, what's happened? He said, uh, you know what's happened. He's been moved. They've taken him from Strangeways and moved him to uh, an open prison called Kirkham. Well, he would, he'd like won the jackpot. He was doing three or four years for grievous bodily harm, and he'd been moved from Strangeways, which is a serious lock-up prison, to an open prison at Kirkham. Come on. And he, only, he worked at Blackpool. Do you become a threat exposing people and try to do the right thing for the prison officers then see you as a target? Because you're not just fighting the inmates, you're now fighting with the, the prison officers as well who are taking bribes, who are beating people up, and you are trying to do the right thing by exposing it. Do you become a target? I did. What happened? I didn't mind. I used to tell them, you know, I mean, it, you just do it straight, you know, play the game straight, and if, if I find out you do anything, then I will report you. I'm not bothered. What sort of corruption is in the prison system? How bad is it? Well, I believe it's worse now than it was then. But, I mean, they used to offer you in inducements. You know, they'd offer you money or whatever. But I always thought, you only can only do this once. You do it once and you've sold your soul. You've had it. You know, the devil owns you then. So I would never do it. No matter what they offered me, I would not do it. It wasn't for sale. What sort so, of stuff were they offering? They are offering you women and... Uh, they offer you money, money that you wanted, you know. But I mean, really, as a as a junior officer or a, a non, a not, not a governor, there's not a great deal that you could do for them, you know. Because if you were a governor grade, then you could get move them from prison to prison. But as a junior officer, you really couldn't. All you could do was take stuff into them. And I wouldn't do that anyway because it was a danger to the other members of staff. But I discovered very quickly that uh, the, there was a big problem at Strangeways with the National Front. Now, the National Front, as you know, is a pseudo-political party that runs on fascist, Nazi kind of uh, ideas of racism and racial pur purity, which uh, to me seemed insane. You know, it does seem insane. Anybody, anybody thinking about this thinks it's crazy. But I got a phone call one night from a guy called Eric Effer, who was at the time the deputy leader of the Labour Party, and he was an MP for Walton, Liverpool Walton. And he said, uh, I'm the Eric Effer, they explained who he was. He said, would you do something for me? He said, I've been given your name. And he said, I want you to, if you will, find out about the National Front at Strange Ways. So I said, all right, I'll do it. So the guy who was leading the National Front was a man called Brian Baldwin. He's passed now. But he was a principal officer, and he was also the chairman of the Prison Officers Association. So he was a, a mover and a shaker at Strange Ways. And uh, I said to him, you know, I said, I believe you're uh, running the National Front. Are you interested, John? He said, I said, uh, well, yeah. He said, 
brilliant. He said, no, I want you to come with me. He said, we've got a special meeting this week. I said, really? He said, yeah, you come with me. He said, uh, you can come with me. And I, yeah, because they wanted me and you know, I don't know. I don't know why. Anyway, I went along and it was a, a meeting place in Manchester, a big hall. And uh, the speaker was, believe it or not, a man called David Duke. Now, David Duke at the time was the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. And he was with Brian Baldwin speaking to the meeting of the National Front. I, I, how mad is this? And they're all jumping up and down, white power. Well, well, these people are off the rockers, you know. At the end of the meeting, Brian said to me, would you come with us? We're having a, a, a special conference. You know, we were going to decide them on the action because they're going to have a march through Manchester through the middle of Manchester. And uh, they sat down with a big map, and uh, David Duke was just sitting in, you know, <clears throat> and uh, Brian Ball was saying, we're coming starting here at the cathedral, marching down Dean's together, we're turning left up Peter Street. He said, and it's at Peter Street where we're going to attack. I said, what do you mean, attack? He said, we've got to be, you know, we've got to have somebody attacking our march. He said, so we're going to... So what they were doing was they were trying to create publicity about the National Front being attacked, but they were going to attack themselves to make sure that it happened. And he said, uh, what, what, what do you suggest, John? He said, you've been a military officer, you know, how, how does it work? I said, well, I said the, the right way will, to do it so that nobody gets really injured would be to throw flour at them. So white flour meets white power. Brilliant! Oh yeah, wonderful. Welcome on board. I thought you bloody bunch of nutcases, you lot. Yeah. So I reported all this in writing to um, Eric Effer, and I sent a copy to um, the Jewish Gazette. <laughs> I mean, that's for sure they were they were very interested in that, and I also contacted some journalists that I knew, and they did a big feature in the national press, including a picture of Brian Baldwin that I gave. <laughs> <laughs> what did they say? Well, it, 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 wild. They banned the paper throughout the prison service. All the prison service banned. It was called the Daily Star before it became a rag. It was a proper paper, but they banned it all through the prison. And Brian Baldwin's going my, wild. You know, how dare you do this? I thought you were one of us. I said, you must be joking, mate. Mm. Did you ever get any threats from the prison officers because of the stuff that you were exposing well yeah to a certain extent but i'd had enough of this you know the prison officers association they were all management you see there were chief officers running it there were principal officers running it and uh the, the non-supervisory grades just weren't didn't weren't they weren't considered I, I was studying at the time i was trying to do a law degree at manchester university and i needed time off to study but I couldn't get time off to study because the POA, the Prison Officers Association, had agreed compulsory overtime with the governor. So when I wanted my time off to go and study, then they said, no, you've got to. So I thought, well, I've got to do something about this. So I thought, well, what I'll do, I'll start a proper trade union, one that actually represents the non-supervisory grade staff. So I had friends who were solicitors and w with them we drew up a rules and regulations, a constitution, and we applied to the uh, certification office to get a certificate of independence and we had meetings and the BBC were filming at this time a documentary called Strange Ways, which was filmed in 1979, screened in 1980. And they followed that in their documentary to a certain extent and you can still see it's on 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 youtube what was the strange way riots like well the strange riots occurred after i'd uh, left the prison service but they practically did what everybody knew eventually would happen the prisoners just have enough yeah <clears throat> they weren't going to take any more and uh, i actually wrote part of a book on that with eric allison believe it or not the guy who i mentioned uh, escape with a bench warrant <laughs> yeah because a strange way right so it is, a, it's, it's very well known absolutely well known and rightly so I mean it was the only way that there was change going to come to the prison system 
that they finally destroyed it. And when the inmates who were on the roof were taken to trial by the government and charged with mutiny and criminal damage and all the rest of it, the solicitors acting for the defence uh, contacted me and asked me to give evidence against the government. So I went to Manchester Crown Court and gave evidence against the prison service, stating that in the event that I had been kept under those diabolical conditions, then the roof would have been coming off with me on top as well. You can imagine how that went down. What happened after that? Well, there was a great deal of change in the prison service. You know, they started to implement sanitation in all the cells. I mean, nowadays it is, to a certain extent, uh, a completely different regime than existed in the 1970s and the 1980s. They no longer have uh, inmates locked into cells without any facilities. They have got, uh, at least, they've got a toilet and a wash basin. Yeah, it's fucking... It's horrible to think listen if you're in prison you're doing bad stuff not everybody in prisons there are guilty to be fair but i've interviewed men who've done big sentences who were not guilty but the majority of people in prison deserve to be there if we're honest and but the, the slopping out and the locked up some of them 24 hours a day it's that's not going to create change that's going to create people who then become anti-authority and hate the system because we all know the system's there if it's, it's flawed it's not there to help people, it's not there to better people's life and understand and then try and improve. It just makes more people are angry. I think the stats are like 60 70% of people who leave prison go back. I believe that the recidivism rate in the 1970s and 80s was still around about 80%. I believe that the recidivism rate now is somewhere around about 60%, as you say. That's, that's people who are in prison uh, coming back to prison. But you see, a regime like that it brings dependency. People become institutionalised. You know, they become dependent upon the institution to actually function. Because in prison, you don't have to think. <clears throat> you get up in the morning, somebody's telling you when to go to the toilet, somebody's telling you when to have your lunch, your dinner, your evening meal. When you go and have a shower, you don't, you're not engaging in anything. And when you get thrown into society, you get £35 and the doors open and off you go where you're going. They don't know where they're going, and they're going back to criminality. But it's only petty criminality. I believe that there is an answer to this. And you see, the problem you've got is you've got government think tanks that don't think because they haven't actually been down there on the ground floor, you know, rolling around the landings with uh, with angry big men. I mean, if they had, then they wouldn't be doing what they're doing now. They'd be thinking along different lines. I believe that a good 40, 50% of the people who are in prison should not be there. There's no real positive purpose for holding those people in prison. None. Shoplifters, addicts. Shoplifters, drug addicts, people who have not paid the fine. There was one guy at Strangeways who was in Strangeways prison for walking his dog in a park in Burnley against the local bylaws. Now... How is that going to benefit society? And the, the, the poor thing was the guy was about 65, 70, and uh, everybody knew what he was in for. So everywhere he went, people were barking at him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, it was, I mean, even the staff. He only lasted about three days and he paid his fine <clears throat> and went out because he couldn't stand it. But it's one way to get your fines paid, doesn't it, to be fair? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, who was, doing the, who was doing the longest sentence? The longest sentences would be people like the IRA. I was on duty one night at the Scrubs, and it was New Year's Eve, and it got to be about a minute to midnight, and everybody starts banging on the door, shouting, Happy New Year. And I was just walking around. The, 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 it was actually the seg at, at the scrubs and uh, one guy banging on his door shouting happy new year he, he, he sell card said lifetime 17 <laughs> i thought yeah what a happy new year you're gonna have yeah what a they're mad aren't they 17 yeah. lifetime sentences yeah it's it's scary to to be think locked up in a cage your whole life but some like I say, some people deserve to be there. The guy who was, had the gimp outfit and destroyed all those women's life, like he deserved to be locked up for prison. There is people who shouldn't be. 
And that's safe in society. In society, a million percent. Was, did you ever come across Charlie Bronson? I never did, but I know about Bronson. Bronson is playing to the gallery. You know, he's a, look at me, I'm Charlie Bronson. And he, I don't think they can let him out. Because if he did, he'd be a target. Some some nut job out there would say, well, I'm going to take Charlie Bronson on, despite the fact that he's nearly 70. You know, so he, he is a threat. Not only to society, but to himself. Was there any inmates you were fearful of or scared of? The the completely insane ones, yeah. Have you ever seen anybody walk like a robot? Mm -hmm. You have, yeah. Where well, they're like the mechanical toys. One mm -hmm. of them was strange ways. I was, he wasn't a particularly big man, but he walked like a robot and there was no response for other than you opened the door and said, go to the, go to the recess you know and he would walk out like a robot to the recess do what he had to do and walk like a robot back and i was a hospital officer at the time and one of my colleagues went up to him right into his face and he said you sniveling maniac bastard and the guy went boom straight on the snot box wow he, he was incredibly powerful Broke my mate's nose, broke his nose, splattered it all over the side of his face. And I just said to this guy, would you like to go back to your cell now? <laughs> back into the clockwork mode and went in his cell. And that was it. They are dangerous. You've got to be careful. Was there many deaths between inmates fighting each other? Any killings? Killings, yeah. Oh, we had one, uh, one or two at the at the, at the scrubs. One one guy came down into the office one day. Said, uh, "That's one off, boss." I said, "What do you mean, one off?" He said, "Oh, I've had enough of him. He's take him off your list. He's not coming back. He murdered somebody in the cell at the scrubs. You know, have you ever seen the film Clockwork Orange, mm -hmm. where they opening their eyes and making them watch? That's what they're doing at the scrubs. That's where it came from." At the scrubs, they had a hospital unit, and in there they had a, a, a chair, like a dentist chair, and they used to get the inmates in, put them down in this chair, and put the uh, eyes on to watch this film. And they'd show them films of monstrous things like children being burnt alive and horrible, terrible things, and they were all wired up to electrodes, yeah? What they were trying to do was ascertain what kind of problems was going on in the head and then they gave them medication and i was talking to the doctor who was running this he said don't oh, that's what it does he said sit down he said we're going to give you a go so i thought well i'll have a go so i sat down and he put these electrodes on me and he started showing me these films horrible films horrible things you know about five minutes of it you know and he had an electro an ecg machine you know and when we'd finished it, he said to me, uh, do you realise, he said, that you could be actively homosexual? I thought, I am getting out of this place quick. <laughs> I'm not giving him a chance to put it to the test. Yeah, they're bloody mad. Yeah. Why did you end up leaving the prison system? Was it for your own free will or did you get sacked or were you becoming so much of a problem by exposing some of this stuff? I'd been assaulted a number of times by prison staff. Uh, one particular incident, it was Christmas Day and uh, the officer I was working with on a clinic, because we ran a clinic, yeah, a medical clinic, and I lived about 10 miles away in a place called Ermston, and he lived about two miles up the road near Presswich. So I said to him, well, as we got to split the lunch hour between us, I said, you can have my lunch hour. I said, I can't go home to Ermston, it's too far, but you can go to Presswich and spend a couple of hours with your family on Christmas Day. I said, now I'll run the clinic so that you've got my lunch hour. I said, I'm all right. I've brought myself an apple and a boiled egg and a book. You know, I said, so have my lunch hour and off you go. So about quarter past 12, off he went. And I thought, oh, well, that's all right for him. You know, I mean, I couldn't do it, but he could. So he came back about half past two and he was absolutely stoned out of his head. He hadn't gone home to see his wife and family. He'd gone into the prison club and got smashed up pissed. And he hadn't just done that. He 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 lost all his money on the one-armed gambling machines, the Bennett, the the bandits, you know, 
slot machines, lost all his money, and he got drunk, and he was in a feel, filthy mood. I said, I didn't know this at the time. I just said to him, what's up with you, lad? you got a face like a slapped ass. You've just been up. And he, he jumped over the desk, because I was at the desk. I put all the medication out, all the uh, the syringes drawn up for the people who had to be injected with insulin and all the rest of it, the diabetics. And he grabbed hold of my neck, and he started strangling me. Well, he was a bloody great big strong man. And the problem was fighting back in the clinic. There was gallon jars of Largactyl and medications all over the place. I thought, if I start doing this, we're bouncing off like John Wayne in the bloody moon. It's going to smash the place up. So I just had to do my best to stop myself from being killed. And somebody eventually came in and dragged him off. I reported that. They said, oh, it's only John. I said, are you mad? So I had to go to the hospital after that. I was off for about a week. They damaged my larynx. I couldn't eat any Christmas dinner when I got home. Yes, yeah, so that was just one of them. But at the end, uh, the, this maniac uh, senior officer, uh, he tried to grab hold of the back of my tunic because I wore a white tunic as a, as a nurse, you know, nursing outfit, you know. And he grabbed hold of the back of my tunic, tried to drag me backwards downstairs I was going up to my work in the in the ward, and uh, to prevent him from doing that, I turned around and stuck one right on the end of his nose and sat him on his ass, and they they suspended me for that. What was it like working in the prison hospital? Did you see a lot of dark stuff then, John? Beyond belief. Like what? Yeah. Uh, well, people have come up to you, the, the, the voices, the voices. So you, you try and calm them down. Next thing you know, this arms through plate glass windows, slashed all the wrists, blood all over the place. We had one guy come in and he was in a catatonic stupor. Have you ever seen that? You know, where they, if you got hold of somebody's arm and they're in a catatonic stupor and they just hold it there, that's it. So they don't move. They don't drink, they don't eat, they don't do anything. They're in, a, they're in like a coma. And uh, the, the doctor was really, were, everybody was really concerned about this guy. So he'd been in there about a day and a half and he was on the hospital ward. So I got his notes, all his clinical notes, because I was in charge, the officer in charge of the hospital ward at the time, and there were about 20 inmates. And uh, I looked at it, he'd been a senior civil servant, like a principal in the civil service. So he was not stupid, this guy. But what had happened was he'd cracked and murdered his wife. They were watching television and he wanted to watch something. She wanted to watch something else. And to solve the argument, he'd strangle her to death, laid her down in front of the television and got on with watching what he wanted to watch. And uh, then he'd switched off. So I got it in my head that this guy was an, in, an intelligent man. So I thought, what? He's likely to enjoy classical music. So I had a little cassette recorder, and I brought it in the next day with about half a dozen cassette tapes of classical music. And I put the earphones on him, and he was just sat in bed like that. And we had to force him to drink water, you know, because he only goes so long without water. And uh, I started playing him things like Tchaikovsky, Beethoven, Chopin. And, and then I got to uh, a piece of music called Bluebeard's Castle by the Hungarian composer Bela Bartok and I put that on and it, 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 he'd been about two minutes three minutes listening to this and then all of a sudden he took the earphones off put them on the bed and said I can't stand Bela Bartok and he was out of his coma so I wrote it all up in the notes because you had to write notes on the psychological observations of the inmates. And the next morning I got called down by the, by the chief officer. And he said, uh, this guy on your ward, he said, you've said here that he hates Bella Bartok. I said, yeah, he hates Bella Bartok. He said, uh, who is she? I said, who is who? He said, you've said that he hates Bella Bartok. Who is she? I said, Bella Bartok's a Hungarian composer. And I was playing him classical music, Bluebeard's Castle, and he didn't like it. And it snapped him out of his catatonic stupor. Get out of my office. <laughs> He's a stupid person, yeah. So, I mean, basically, there were some weird people in there. And I just think that people have been promoted beyond their level of capabilities. What's the worst thing about the prison system, John? 
The prison system owes a duty of care to all those that are in inside incarcerated and it fails miserably to meet that responsibility <clears throat> i mean if it was your brother yeah or your sister or your mother or your dad or yourself in prison you would reasonably expect that you would be physically safe and cared for the sentence of the courts is that you lose your liberty not that you've been mistreated, abused, insulted and degraded by staff and by the system. But the government seems to have lost this. I believe that the real way to deal with this is for there to be a massive class action against the government for failure to meet the basic human rights of the people that they are holding in custody because they are at risk. And people who have got uh, family members who are in prison who are vulnerable, and very often you'll find that people who are psychologically disturbed are, find themselves in prison not because they've got criminal inclinations, but because of their psychological issues that put them at odds with authority. And the, the police are not equipped to deal with the, such incidences. And certainly putting people into prisons like Wandsworth, Strangeways, Wormwood Scrubs, Armley Jail, Victorian Dungeons is not the way to deal with people who are psychiatrically disturbed. And you'll find that there's a good 40% of the prison system in that category. Also, you'll find that there are people who are illiterate, enumerate, uh, social, socially incapable, what they should be running is schools to actually produce people who are fit for society, not alienating people and creating uh, a, a repeating cycle of abuse and deprivation. And that's where we're at at the moment. And how was it leaving the prison system after 10 years? Was that an easy decision? Well, it wasn't a decision I made. It was a decision that the Home Office made because uh, after I was assaulted by that member of staff, gave him a clattering and uh, was uh, suspended. Uh, my wife said, this is the end of it, John. You can't go on like this. You cannot go on. Yeah, you've got to go and see your doctor. I've been to see my doctor about four times about being assaulted by various members of staff. And my doctor said, oh, I'm putting you on the sick. You know, I said, it just can't go on like this. Uh, and very soon the Home Office uh, instructed that I had to be psychiatrically ob assessed. So they sent me to see a psychiatrist. What did you do after that? Well, the psychiatrist uh, sat down and talked to me for about two hours. And at the end of it, he said, I have to tell you, Mr. Sutton, he said, uh, you're perfectly sane. He said, I've listened to what you say, and you're making absolute sense to me. He said, you're sane, he said, but where you're working isn't. He said, and you are not psychologically suitable to work in such premises. He said, I am recommending that you be medically retired and that you never return to HM prisons again, and that was it. Did you miss it? Even though it was madness? Uh, I never missed working in the prisons, and as I say, to this day, I still suffer to a certain degree from post-traumatic stress disorder. What did you do with your life after the prison service? Uh, I managed to retrain and get, get myself a teaching certificate, and uh, a teaching certificate got me a job with Lancashire County Council teaching adults with learning difficulties. And whilst I was doing that, uh, one of my friends phoned me up and said, uh, there's a man living in Bolton that you want to go and see. I said, oh, is there? He said, who's that? He said, it's PJ Proby, the pop singer. I said, is it really? I used to like PJ Proby, you see, when I was a young lad. So I went to see Proby and I said, uh, are you interested in uh, me writing a song for you? Because I, I, I can write, you see. So he said, yes, yeah. you, you get me a demo disc, he said, and I'll tell you if it's any good. So I wrote a song called Stage of Fools, and I got somebody I knew to record it as a demo, and I took it to him, and he said, yeah, I'll do that. So I recorded Proby doing that, and uh, that was on the road. We went to continue to do that, and I made an album with him, and that was released. And we were on TV, and no sooner was I on TV than I was suddenly surrounded by people who wanted me to manage them. 
And uh, I went on to manage numerous people. I fell out with Prober because he was a pervert, you see. Who's that? He's a pervert. Uh, he liked little girls. What? Who was us? This this is PJ Prober, the pop singer. He was on with the Beatles and all that. He was big news in the 1960s. But this is 1990. And I got a call from him one day. He said, John, he's texting you. I was from Houston, Texas. John, you come up and meet my new wife. I said, I'll come up there and have a say hello, Jim. So he lives at Bolton. So I went up to see him. And uh, in his house was a lady who was about 45 years old. So I introduced myself. I said, I'm John. You know, I said, I believe you're getting married to PJ Proby, my mate, Jim. Uh, and Proby was sat down in the chair said, that's not my bloody wife. He says, this is my wife. And out of the kitchen came an 11-year-old girl. And uh, he introduced me to her. She was about four foot two. You know, she was a little girl. And uh, he said, we're getting married here. And he showed me all these brochures about this big hotel. And we're going to honeymoon here. And uh, he said, and you were coming to my wedding, John. I said, oh, well. Thank you very much, Jim, you know. Uh, and I said to this lady, have you got a copy of his new album? No, no. I said, well, I'm getting copies next week. I said, give us your name and address and I'll post them to you as soon as I get them. Oh, that's very kind of you. So she gave me a name and address. As soon as I got out of there, I went and phoned up the duty social services officer at uh, where she lived and reported the child as being at risk. And uh, do you know what they said to me? They said... This is a very serious allegation you're making. I said, uh, I've given you my name and address, haven't I? They said, yes, you have. I said, now give me your name. Oh, well, what do you want that for? I said, well, if I ever see that girl anywhere near PJ Proby again, I said, I'll be phoning the police. I said, and the name I'm going to be giving them is yours. Now, what is your name? They never saw that girl again. They took action. I think they took her into care. She was at risk. Her mother was trying to get close to PJ Proby, you see, and using her 11-year-old daughter to do it. Sat cunt, the mum has will. Mad will, oh, yeah. yeah. And Proby, the next time I saw him, he had a big bowie knife about ooh, 18 inches long, come running out the house, I'll oh, murder you, you bastard. <laughs> yeah, but he, at least he never got his hands on that little girl. So the mum was basically taking an 11-year-old yeah. girl to get close to him. To get close to Proby, yeah. Yeah, that's sick, man. I, I hate stuff like that. That's, well, that's what happens. <clears throat> that's the world. That's how people like Gary Glitter and Jimmy Savile do it. But the thing the is, let me fires. tell you this, the minute that you step out of line and point the finger and say, this is this is wrong, you've had it. You've finished. You're the target. You're the one. You're yeah. wrong. You're, You're seeing a lot of that now. A lot of people speaking out against the the corruption, the big names, and you see the consequences of doing that. It's but, scary out there, and you're doing trial by media now where the media mm -hmm. prints something and automatically you're guilty, and this is a sad reality of life. Well, they're only interested in promoting the media, aren't they? I mean, no names, but, I mean, I've seen some of the interviews that that particular individual who's in the news at the moment has been giving, and he's been asking for it. He has been asking for it, really. I mean, I can't say whether or not he's been guilty of that, but he's certainly been portraying himself as being a predator. Mm -hmm. You know, he has all the, all the body language, all the, all the verbals, everything, it's all there. So all they need now is the evidence. Yeah, that's what you need is evidence. evidence. But the trial by media is, is a mad thing. Look, yeah. They do genuinely shut people down, but you cannot discredit any victim that comes across. And whether it's 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, mm. I spoke to a man yesterday, a, a, a man yesterday who was abused and it took him 20 years to come forward and speak so some people find strength when they hear about one person mm -hmm. coming forward but again there's still got to be evidence and got people be evidence. sitting on I could get 10 people to make accusations against you so it's easy for people to sit on camera with their face covered making accusations but I, I believe everybody has a right to defend mm -hmm. themselves as well yeah. but sometimes and the thing about this a lot of these people like you say are predators but what they're very good at doing is realising it's going to come on top. So what they'll do is then speak out as if it's all set up for them, as if people are against them because they're speaking out. So you've got to be careful and question every angle. Like I say, if there's concrete evidence and if they're abusing women and children, mm. the fuckers deserve to be put away. In my eyes, they deserve a bullet in the head and that's the only way they can protect people <laughs> around them. But mm. I do, and the, other, and the flip side, 
I do know how the media work as well and how it can shut people down and cancel people and discredit people. You were in the prison system. They try yeah. to discredit you. They tried to to twist things and, and deflect things to then put the blame on you because you were exposing the governor, you were exposing mm. prison guards. And if that's only someone who works in the prison system, what's it like with someone with a big following? Well, yeah, if they want to do it, they will do it. Yeah. yeah. And and the thing is, I mean, a lot of this, I mean, the, the, the people who are in authority are complicit to this. Mm -hmm. They allow it to happen. But the problem with people who are in the public eye, they're making money. People like Jimmy Savile are producing mass, massive audiences. And that with that massive audience comes cash. And if you... If you rock that boat, then you're the one on the out. I mean, no sooner did I point out that Proby was a pervert, that was the end of it. That was the doors closed. You know, he wouldn't work with me. Everybody that was associated with it wouldn't have anything to do with it. I had just released an album with him, uh, a record album. I got national, well, international distribution through BMG. Yeah, nationally, Europe all over the world mm -hmm. and he refused to promote it he ref he denied that it was him it was virtually death for that that particular project and i'd done that because i would reported him yeah fair play though you've got to do the right thing for your soul because fuck the money fuck the attention fuck mm. the album because if mm. you're saving our young girl's life then that's, that's the good stuff that's the glory that's the that is protecting the way, kids uh, but again, the sad reality is exposing the people who are doing this fuckery, it then comes on top for you where yeah. sometimes you mm -hmm. can be the bad I, one. That's right. I was, but I didn't mind. I mean, I, at least I wasn't involving myself in child abuse. Yeah, and the mother should be fucking... She probably was, I don't know. I mean, bitch, they, 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 never, they never got back to me. But yeah. I was, as I said, I was working for social services at the time and there were repercussions there because the director of social services for Lancashire County Council sent for me and said, I want you to explain why you've been speaking to these uh, social workers. Well, I had to tell her. Are you a psychic as well, John? Yeah, I, I do. Strangely enough, uh, as after I started to appear on television, uh, at my front door came numerous people who were psychics, clairvoyants, and they said the spirit world have sent us to tell you that you're working for the spirit world now, and that you have got to you've got to help us. You've got to help get the message across that there is no death and it's a very strange thing i had a friend a really nice guy and he went on holiday to the gambia which is part of africa you know mm -hmm. and he said while he was there they, they, they had a tour into the into the outbacks and in the outbacks there was a guy in a mud hut who they said was a, like a doc uh, a, a, a witch doctor you know he said, and I went to see this witch doctor. He said, no, he didn't expect much. And his witch doctor, this witch doctor said to him, there is a man in England and his name is John and he's your friend. And when you get back, you tell him that the spirit world are shouting at him. It's time to work. So when he came back, he came to see me. He says, you know, the only John I really know is my friend. He said, and uh, there's a witch doctor in the Gambia that says to tell you it's time to work. And all these psychics kept turning up to my door. So I eventually ended up agreeing to work with the psychics. I went to, when you say clairvoyant, do you see the future past, future lives, past lives? What do you see? I, 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 I never question it, you see. I just give what I get. Yeah, and I do see things that are going to happen in the future, and I do hear things. And I, was, I spent 27 years as the feature editor of a newspaper called Psychic World, which is the Journal of Spiritualism. And I went around the country. I worked with a guy called James Byrne. He was a big-name psychic in the 70s, in the 80s and 90s. And uh, he went to, with me to the London Palladium. We did the London Palladium. So well, this was serious stuff, because I knew all about show business, having worked with PJ Proby, you see. Do you, feel, do you think everybody has a gift? That no, they just don't no get everybody, everybody has a certain gift, but as you become socialised from the age of about five or six onwards, 
then it, 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 it just gets swallowed into your, you're too busy living your life. Mm -hmm. It started with me at the age of about five. Uh, my father was a police officer, a very strict man. And when he said it's time for bed, it was time for bed. And uh, we lived in a big old Victorian house and the old doors had locks on them. Mm -hmm. And at six o'clock at night, I was put to bed and the door was locked. I mean, it's crazy you now, you wouldn't do it now, but yeah. he did. I think he thought he was doing the right thing, you know. And uh, I was only five or six years old, beautiful summer day outside, you know, and uh, I want to go out and play, but I'm only a kid. I couldn't read, I was too young, so I started counting the flowers on the wallpaper. How many flowers can I count? And suddenly, I was no longer counting flowers on the wallpaper in the in a room in a in a, a house. I was in a world far away from where I was. It was as if I went through the wall and I went back to a place where they had thousands of men, brown-skinned men, dragging stones across the desert. And I was standing on a, a platform and I had a white robe on and I had scripts in front of me, like drawings, and I was directing all these men. And I didn't just see this, I became that man. And I know I became that man because I could see who it was. And then suddenly I entered this man through the back of his neck. And I became that man. And when I came back the following day into my room, and I was telling my dad, oh, look, I've seen this. It's absolutely incredible. He's, he, was a, he was a Catholic, you see. He said, you mustn't speak about that. It's the work of the devil. Work of the devil? I was five years old. What do I know about that? And that continued... That continued for a period of time. You know, that I was able to travel back. And I believe that uh, what I was seeing was the creation of the pyramids like five or 6,000 years ago. And that I had been the architect in a past life that de helped design those. And I'd flown back in, in through time and space to that point. And that was the first psychic experience I ever had. Are you talking like astral travel? Yeah, I still travel through the because there's no time. There's no time. Dimensions. There is no time. There's different dimensions. So I went. I went into another dimension where I had been alive in a past life, maybe six thousand years ago, as one of the architects who was in charge of the building of these pyramids, and they were dragging the stones across the desert. How do you think the pyramids were made? I think they were designed, and uh, I mean, obviously, at, at the time, they must have had some kind of very complex ability to create the actual cubes of stone. But I believe that what they'd done was mound up the uh, the earth and build them a step at a time like that. So you'd build the basement, yeah? Then you'd put the, put the earth, then you'd build the next layer, then you'd put the... The, the, the sand and the earth, then you build the next and so on and so on until you got to the top. And then when you got to the top and put the final stones on, you removed all the earth and there it was. Well, how do you see things now, John? Do you feel things? Do you feel spirits? Do you see dead people? How does it, because everybody's got different Occasionally, gifts. occasionally. I mean, I've seen my father numerous times. Uh, as I said, he was a police officer. He was a detective inspector uh, towards the end of his career. And, uh, He'd been dead about three months and I went into my house where I was living and he'd never been in there. And he was sat in a chair, just as alive as you are. And I just said to him, hello, Dad, what are you doing here? And he just disappeared. Does that scare you or does it... No, and it... Or, it, it, it or does it, it make you think you're, you're losing your shit so maybe the psychiatric reports were right and you should be in <laughs> fucking Broadmoor? Yeah, no, well, at the time I hadn't joined the prison service, at the time I was wondering what to do and I think he'd come back and say, you're going to find your way, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but he was he was there, but he looked just like he did just before he died. Mm -hmm. I've seen him again uh, a number of times and he looks like a young man now. Yeah, I believe in all that. I've got a good friend back home, Margaret Solis, and... Very powerful woman. Um, yeah. She taught me so many things that's came to, and I thought, wow. And you can question it, and you can be skeptic, but there's people who are gifted out there. So it's okay for people to think, oh, maybe he is crazy. But the genuine is people gifted who can see things and feel things. I oh, believe just, I've... just for real. I mean, I worked for a while with Derek Akora, the guy who used to be uh, on Most Haunted. Mm -hmm. You know, he, like a show business character. 
But when he came to me, he was working in the back streets of Liverpool and he'd never been accepted into uh, the mainstream. And he was following me around for about two years. Everywhere I went, I put a show on, he'd turn up. Oh, you've got to manage me. You've got... I was busy, you know. I had... So I eventually said, go on, I'll talk to you now. So when I did talk to him, I thought, he's got show, he's got charisma, this man. He can do it. Mm -hmm. So I wrote his book, which was published by Piacus, and uh, then I got him a TV series with Granada, and the rest is history. What do you think life is now, in your own personal opinion, what do you think life is? It's very transitory. We're only here for a brief blink in time. But I, 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 as you sow, so shall you reap, you know. So every day I believe that what I'm doing is building the house I'm going to live in in the next dimension. So I have to do some good. I don't believe in doing bad. If I can avoid doing harm, then I will. How many books have you written, John? I've written 16, I believe, 16, yeah. Are they all any fiction? Are they all new life? Uh, on, on, on basically, uh, there were biographies, or, and I've written my own autobiography uh, about the prisons, HMP, Manchester Prison Officer. Uh, I've written that. I wrote books for, I wrote Derek Acora's book. I wrote James Byrne's book. He was a big name at one time, James Byrne. Who's he? He was a psychic, a medium from Bolton. We did loads of stuff with him. We did a big psychic experiment with James Whale. On uh, when he had a TV show called the James World Ra World Radio Show, James World Radio Show on TV, you know, did a psychic experiment. I, I designed all that and produced it. So, from going absolutely nowhere, from being nowhere as a jailer to actually producing TV shows and being on media all around the world, Walt Disney flew me to America, and I did a TV show with Walt Disney at uh, where was it? Orlando in the MGM theatre in Orlando uh, they had me as a special guest my picture's still up there believe it or not but you've got that wizardy look with the hat the beard and the hair you've kind of got that as he possibly spiritual or kind of connected because there's an amazing woman and she's it's actually Blackpool Pleasure Beach mm -hmm. who's a psychic yeah and she's fucking unbelievable she is unbelievable and people think ah Blackpool and people think ah mm. nah she's unbelievable I've been to see her twice now, and she's very gifted. Well, she'll know my name. Yeah. Because they all know my name. Seriously. But I, I was going to say, I went to America, did uh, the MGM Theatre, was filmed for The Animal Planet with uh, with Walt Disney. And, uh, well, it's strange, I was in uh, Hollywood. I put a show on on Hollywood Boulevard at the Vogue Theatre with Derek Acora. And uh, I was standing outside the Vogue Theatre looking at what they put up, all the posters and all the rest of it. And uh, a woman came up to me. She said, can I have your autograph? I said, uh, what my autograph for? She said, oh, you've just been on television. Uh, I didn't know it, but Disney had done a repeat of the show that I did, and she'd just seen me. And so there I was for one... That's the only time it ever happened. <laughs> but for one brief moment in time, somebody wanted my autograph. Yeah. What's the plans for the future, John? I've got more books to come out. Absolutely more books. And I'm a poet as well. I write poetry and I do tour. Uh, I've been going on tour as a poet with, uh, who did I do it with? Uh, what was his name? The uh, Attila the Stockbroker. Have you ever heard of him? No. He's a punk rock poet. So I did a, a, a show with him and uh, I've got a, a mate called Ron Ellis. He's a poet. And we go on stage and do shows, you know. What about, where can people buy your books, first of all? Amazon is the place, you know, get it on Amazon. Amazon, the books are out there, and uh, there's there's a couple of them on audio, from audio book as well, mm -hmm. Audible. If you were the governor of a prison, what changes would you make to make the prison system better where people aren't re-offending to then 60, 70% of people coming back to prison after they get released? What would you change? Well, as the governor, my powers would be extremely limited, you know, because governors can't do a great deal. All they can do is operate within a system that is completely broken, in my opinion. It would have to be above that level. It would have to be at cabinet level. And at cabinet level, I would say we've got to release all, all inmates who are serving less 
than six months in prison. Get them out. Empty them. And then we're going to change the regime in prison. I would do away with what I call the hostess system which is uh, attracting 18-year-old girls to come and work as prison staff in the, in the prisons. I would do away with that. It's an, uh, it doesn't make sense when you think about it, really, to have teenage girls acting as prison officers in life, if life of prisons and tough prisons. It doesn't make sense. It's, a, it's an insult to the, the integrity of the system, I believe. I mean, I understand that they're working there and they're doing their very best, but they're in the wrong place. It's not the place for young girls, not the place for women. It's a man's prison, and that's how it should be run. And I would change the system from it being punitive to being educational, so that the minimum sentence you could be given by the courts would be three years. And during that three years, you'd have to study during that three years. So if you were enumerate when you came in, then you would be prepared to work in society when you came out. So you would be educated, advised, guided, and you'd come out with some semblance of an ability to actually function in society. Because a good 40, 50% of the people in prison can't function outside. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would do. For anybody that's watching, John, that's maybe struggling in life, what advice would you have for them? Don't give up hope, yeah. There's always a chance. And get yourself educated to the best of your ability. I mean, I never stopped uh, going to college. I, I tried to stick at it. Despite working 60 hours a week at Strangeways, I was still doing numerous night school courses and studying at the weekend. And I eventually got quite reasonably qualified and got myself some decent jobs. And it, and it also improved my ability to write, as proven by the fact that I've been published by the big, biggest publishing houses in the world. So it can be done. Just believe in yourself and don't give in. Yeah. John, listen, would you like to finish up on anything else? Well, I'd like to suggest that people have a read at my book because uh, I'm telling the truth in there and the people who are losing hope and they're, they're, their families are in the system and they wonder what it's like. Well, I can only tell you what it was like and that's what it tells in my book and it's out on Amazon. John, listen, for coming on today and telling your story, I thoroughly enjoyed that. I wish you all the best for the future and I look forward to see what you do. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you.